different exercises at times. You can hear a lot of different uh, terms that people will use about things we have to train. Um, I want to try to kind of simplify that, summarize things, and, and uh, show you how to like put it together into a training plan. Okay, uh, So you kind of get an idea of like, this is what I need to do, as opposed to just having a bunch of ideas. All right. So uh, in order to do that, we got to go through a bunch of stuff first. So I'm going to try to like cover a section, ask if there's any questions, cover a section, ask if there's any questions. But I'm going to have to try to move pretty quick because there is a bunch of stuff. All right. So first, we're going to be talking about five physical qualities that contribute to athleticism. All right. Now, in actuality, the human body is way more complex than five qualities. There'd be a whole lot of um, you know, cellular level physiology and anatomy we could talk about, um, but we're going to talk more about <coughs> large scale these five things, okay? To try, try to keep it fairly simple. All right, so we got technique, flexibility, strength, explosiveness, and elasticity. All right, so we're going to go through those one at a time. Uh, technique, technique, you guys know roughly what it is, right? It's the way you execute a movement, okay? Um, it is specific to that movement, right? So developing good jumping technique is not going to give you necessarily um, good throwing technique or something like that, right? It's specific to that movement. Um, and technique is somewhat unique in that sense. Um, technique is going to address the physics of the task at hand, okay? So in the case of jumping, we're trying to create a large impulse, um, generating high force throughout a contact time. I know John was talking about this yesterday. Hopefully you guys are paying attention. Okay, so that's the physics of jumping. Uh, it also is going to exploit the abilities of the athlete, okay? Um, so different people with different body types, different force production characteristics, um, yeah, they have different internal abilities. They're gonna use different techniques when they jump, okay? Now, that doesn't mean there's not common principles, okay? Um, but we do have to be careful when it comes to technique and not trying to force people too rigidly into a, uh, a very narrow technique, okay? Because if you have a different body type, different set of abilities, you're gonna use different technique, okay? Uh, speed versus power jumping is an example of that, just like John talked about, right? Got, got the butt kick versus the toe drag and single leg jumping. Um, that is a reflection of the abilities of that athlete, all right, to some degree, okay? Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, good, next. Flexibility. All right, so I am a believer in flexibility, um, not necessarily um, contortionist flexibility, but a certain level of it, okay? Um, flexibility allows high speed joint movement, okay? So, uh, most common example of that would be your hip flexor, right? We talk about the importance of hip extension power when we're jumping and sprinting. Hip flexion resists, or your hip flexor resists hip extension. So, if your hip flexor is tight, reduces the power of your hip extension, reduces athleticism, okay? So, we need flexibility for high speed movement, okay? Um, also, what we really want is long muscles, okay, which is somewhat a separate thing than just having uh, a large range of motion, okay? So we'll talk a little bit more um, in detail about that when we get into the structural strength part. Um, but yeah, so long muscles are gonna be more powerful and they're also gonna be less injury prone, okay? So we want flexibility as part of the equation. Okay, next is strength. All right, so in the exercise science world, people will talk about strength in a lot of different ways. They'll talk about like explosive strength, reactive strength, strength speed, speed strength, all these terms. And it, uh, they use strength to refer basically to all these different types of force production. Um, what I'm talking about really is maximum strength, okay? Um, which is a reflection of like the maximum amount of force that your muscles can produce. Um, so you measure that in a situation where you're moving a load that is challenging to move, okay? So yeah, when I say strength, it's a, it's a pretty specific thing. It's maximum strength we're talking about. Okay, now strength, uh, we can break it up into structural and neurological. Okay, so structural would re re refer to the, the physical strength of like your protein filaments in the muscle, um, the fascia, the connective tissue that surrounds those protein filaments, as well as the tendons that attach them to the bones. Okay, so we're talking about the physical strength of these structures. So think about, you know, you have a, like a steel cable and then you have like a thicker steel cable, right? That's uh, a reflection of increased structural strength. Uh, but then we also have neurological strength because your muscles are controlled by your nervous system. Okay, so um, the signals from your nervous system are what stimulate contraction, stimulate tension in your muscles. So uh, neurological strength actually plays a huge role in pretty much everything we do. Um, so the things we're looking at there are how many of your muscle fibers can you activate? And then um, rate coding is a reference to how many signals can you send per second to those muscle fibers? Okay, the more signals you send per second, the higher the tension you stimulate. Okay?
okay? Uh, the, uh, the analogy for it is a light bulb, right? Okay, so we have a light bulb, it's on an electrical circuit. Um, if we have a thicker filament in that light bulb, it can burn brighter, right? And that would be like higher structural strength. But also, if we send more current through the, uh, the circuit, the light bulb will also burn brighter, even if the filament's not thicker. Okay, so that would be like the higher neurological strength. Okay, so we got two kind of two components of strength there. Next, explosiveness. This is the rate at which muscular force is generated. Okay, so we use the term explosiveness a lot of times, sort of like as this generic term for athleticism, right? Like, oh, that's an explosive athlete. Um, here we're being more specific. Okay, we're talking about a percentage of your maximum force that you can generate uh, in a given unit of time. Okay, so let's just say my quadriceps can generate um, 500 newtons of tension. If I can get to 250 newtons of tension in 0.2 seconds, then I have, uh, yeah, you know, 250 over 0.2 sometimes. So 1,250 newtons per second uh, would be like my rate of force development. Okay, but we would, we got to think in terms of percentage. So yeah, it would be more like half of my uh, max tension in two tenths of a second would be like a unit to put on it. All right, is that getting a little confusing? No, we're good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I just want to be clear that explosiveness, being really explosive, doesn't necessarily mean you're generating a lot of force if your max force is low. Okay. It's about the percentage of your force that you can generate in a, in a given amount of time. All right. That's going to be determined by your nervous system. Again, this is how fast can you activate fibers? How fast can you scale up that frequency of the signals? Okay. Um, and then, yeah. So this last point is it's strength times explosiveness is what's gonna determine how much force you actually produce in a given amount of time, okay? And then in the exercise science world, we have the term rate of force development or RFD, okay? Um, so yeah, strength times explosiveness equals RFD. A lot of people might just use explosiveness to refer to RFD, but we're being a little more uh, particular about what that means here, okay? Uh, next, elasticity. So I, yeah, this carpet wasn't gonna work real well for the golf ball. Uh, elasticity is energy return. Okay, so if we have a certain amount of um, energy going into a collision or an interaction with some other physical object, if we get a lot of um, kinetic energy back, then that is a, 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 a highly elastic collision. So I was, gonna, I was hoping it's cement, but to drop a golf ball on cement, it's gonna bounce back almost as high as it was dropped from, okay? So we have a good, it's a, called a restitution of kinetic energy when you bounce off the ground. Okay, so that's a golf ball is, is an example of elasticity. Okay, so we want your body when you run and jump and do athletic things to be like a golf ball in that sense. All right, so that quality is going to come from one structure. All right, so we need elastic structures in the body. And this would be looking again at um, the muscles, the uh, fascia that surrounds the muscles, and the tendons. Okay, um, and so yeah, if we were comparing, say, a golf ball to like a rock, you drop a rock on concrete, it doesn't bounce back, right? The rock is hard. We could say the rock is strong, but it's not elastic. Okay, so this is a different thing from just like being strong. Okay, there's a specific tissue quality there of the, uh, those structures that I mentioned. All right, so the structure is a big factor in elasticity. Also, eccentric rate of force development. So that's when you hit the ground, how fast can you uh, stimulate the tension to prevent yourself from collapsing, right? I think John talked about this one too. A little bit. A little bit, okay. Um, so yeah, when I, I have to turn on tension when I plant my foot to jump, right? The faster I can turn on that tension, uh, the more I can spring out, or the faster I can spring out of that. Okay, so I'm gonna get a more elastic collision if I have a uh, higher eccentric rate of force development. And then also the stress reflex. Anybody know what the stress reflex is? No, okay. So it is a reflex that activates when a muscle is lengthening, okay? So again, if I plant my foot on the ground, my knee starts to bend, my quadriceps muscle is going to start to lengthen very quickly. The stretch reflex um, is controlled by a sensor in the muscle that's going to sense that fast lengthening and it's going to stimulate uh, a contraction to amplify the, uh, the force uh, occurring in your quadriceps. Okay, So it's actually not even the, the um, reflex goes, the signal goes from your spine and back to your quad and then you have to go to your brain. All right, So it's a very fast reflex that happens when we are planting on the ground, okay? So those are the things that are gonna control elasticity. All right, questions, any of that? Okay. Yes. A golf ball, uh, is it the best example? Like, would not a cross ball be a better example? When the what? Lacrosse ball or uh, ball? 
it's probably going to depend on the surface you drop it on. Golf ball on concrete is the most elastic I've seen. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it'll bounce right back up. Uh, lacrosse ball on, yeah, the weightlifting platform might be a little bit better. Yeah, it depends on both surfaces, so it's a little tricky as far as that analogy. Have you good, like, uh, work to different kind of elasticities, or is it more like a fit tendon work? Uh, I'm not sure, man. Different types of elasticity. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You I mean, might have to ask a physicist about that. But physics, like elasticity, you mean like stretching or? Like no, 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 no. So we're talking again. It's about the energy return. So uh, actually, I have a yeah Instagram video about this. But so the, the quality we're looking for elasticity when it comes to athleticism is actually like the opposite of stretching. So like an elastic uh, high jumper, for example, when they plant their leg, they're not going to give very much. Their leg's going to be very stiff. Yeah. And so they're, they're going to propel and they're going to bounce off the ground very quickly. Like stiffness, like yes, around. yes. Stiffness would be another way to determine it. Yes. Yes. How is that different than like stretching or just How is it different from the stretch shortening cycle? I mean, I would say that the stretch shortening cycle occurs even if we don't have an elastic collision. Like if I do a deep deep uh, counter movement for a vertical jump. Still stretch shortening cycle, but not as elastic as like a high jump. Does that make sense? Yep, there's more for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. All right, any other questions? Do we have a grasp on those abilities that we're talking about? Some more, yes? Okay. All right, so now we have those abilities, so then moving on to some training methods. All right, so we're going to talk about jumping, stretching, strength training, and then sprinting and plyometrics, uh, basically like other explosive types of training besides jumping. All right, so these are, this encompasses a lot of the training um, exercises that you would see. Okay, so first let's talk about jumping. So what do we get from jumping? A lot of stuff, right? You get technique, uh, you get explosiveness, right, because you're training yourself to produce a lot of force in a short amount of time. You get elasticity to some degree, okay, because you're doing an elastic activity. Uh, and you also will develop some level of strength, okay? So people tend to think of strength training as it's got to be like weights, it's got to be something hard. But really, everything you do is strength training to some degree, right? It's all relative. So like if someone's been in bed in a coma for three months, when they stand up out of bed, that's strength training for them, okay? Um, so yeah, jumping does provide some strength stimulus, right? It's not the strongest strength stimulus that we can come up with, but it does give us some level of strength. Same thing with sprinting. Uh, playing sports in general, right? It's going to give us some level of strength. All right, so we get a lot of stuff just from jumping, okay? So jumping is really the foundation of jumping. Go, go figure, right? Um, if you want to be good at something, you should do it, okay? So how much, how far are you going to get just from jumping? Um, genetics are going to play a big role there, okay? Uh, other things we'd, we'd be looking at would be uh, nutrition. Uh, sleep is one I put in there. How, how much you take care of your body. Um, and then also the big picture of your training, right? So if I jump and I'm healthy and I'm jumping a couple hundred times a week, that's a really great jumping stimulus. Um, but if I'm also playing basketball and conditioning and doing uh, exhaustive bodybuilding workouts, that's going to take away from the benefit that I'll get from all that jumping. Okay, so the big picture of your training matters. All right, uh, so example, Nico, Nico Dunks, right? You guys know him. Uh, he got over a 40 inch vertical basically just by jumping his whole life. Okay. Um, and he, along, along the way, he actually got pretty strong as well. Now, in the last few years, he has begun to use strength training more, um, but he actually was already pretty strong when he started strength training. And within a couple years, he's like a 500 pound sumo deadlifter. Okay, so he, he gained a lot between his genetics and then just jumping a lot. Um, he gained a lot of strength to go along with the technique, explosiveness, elasticity. That's why he was able to jump very high uh, without any training outside of jumping, really. Uh, but compare that to some of the female volleyball players I work with. Uh, volleyball players jump thousands of times in a week sometimes. Tons of practice, tons of private sessions. Uh, but maybe they don't have the same genetics as Nico, right? Maybe they don't have the same testosterone levels, uh, things of that nature. Okay, so then they could do all that jumping and they end up with a 20-inch approach vertical. Okay, at the end of high school. All right, so it's, uh, you don't really know how much you're going to get from jumping, but jumping should be the foundation of your training. Okay, again, if you want to jump well, you got to jump, okay? So, how often should we jump? If we were just looking at technique, 
we'd want to use high frequency, right? We would uh, learn that te technique really well by jumping often, okay? Uh, if we were just to consider explosiveness, strength, elasticity, maybe we'd do more like three or four days a week, and then probably sometimes we would rest more than that in a week to kind of get some recovery from those three or four days. Uh, but the problem is jumping has really high knee stress, okay? So if we consider that, that's where we start thinking, maybe I should only do this once or twice per week, okay? And we should also maybe limit the volume, right? So I put 20 approach jumps per session just as kind of an estimate there. Um, yeah, it would be nice to jump more, and I think you certainly can if you have um, built up the strength in your, uh, your quadriceps tendon, tendons, your patellar tendons, uh, to handle that. If you're confident in the strength you have in those tendons, you could jump more. Um, for most people, it's probably better to have a little bit of a conservative approach, okay? All right, so uh, we have jumping as our first training method, and we're gonna start putting together a sample program, okay? So we're just looking at seven days of the week, and we're gonna start kind of adding things as we talk about them, okay? So first thing we're putting in there, two jump sessions, all right? That would be, oh, what's happening, John? You're uh, good. <laughs> okay. Next, we're going to talk about stretching. So, why should we stretch? First of all, in order to get flexible, okay? Um, now, we know that stretching does increase range of motion. Now, what is the adaptation to stretching? This is a big di uh, discussion, a big um, rabbit hole we could go down, okay? There's this question of when we stretch, are we actually changing the structure of the muscle, or are we just uh, altering the nervous system's tolerance to that stretch. Um, and people would argue, if we're just changing the nervous system, um, maybe we don't have the same value from stretching that we think we do. Um, and so yeah, I don't really want to get down that rabbit hole. Um, but the end goal is we want to have long muscle length, okay? So long muscle length is gonna come from not just stretching, but from actually training with range of motion, uh, whether it be Explosive training, where we're hitting like wide range of motion and like jump takeoffs and stuff, or uh, full range of motion strength training, like um, like what Ben was talking about. Okay, so the, the difference there is uh, when you have a when I, when I say a, a long muscle, um, what we're really talking about is we have basically like more links in the chain of the muscle. Okay, so we have these um, contractile units of protein in the muscles; they're called sarcomeres, and if we can get more of those in a row. That's really the adaptation that we want. So that's what I mean when I say a longer muscle. So that's the, that's the adaptation that's gonna give us more muscular power and protection from injury, okay? Is getting those more links in the chain of the muscle, so to speak, okay? So yeah, we, in order to get that, stretching may or may not do that, okay? It's kind of hazy, the research on that. Um, so the end goal is we wanna stretch to get range of motion, but then we also wanna train that range of motion with explosive training and strength training. Okay, so again, it's, it's uh, like Ben was talking about, it's not just flexibility, it's flexibility plus strength. All right, so that's, but uh, yeah, a lot of times you're gonna have to do the stretching to get the range of motion in the first place. Okay, uh, how often should we stretch? It can be daily, for sure, right? Stretching is not like highly stressful on your body. It may feel pretty uh, uncomfortable and stressful in that sense, but it's not something that's gonna like fatigue you the next day. Okay, so it can be daily. If you need to improve flexibility in a particular muscle, you could do that uh, multiple times per day to make that improvement faster, all right? Uh, once you get to a level that is uh, you know, appropriate and you think you maybe can just maintain it from there, you may actually not need to stretch very much at all, okay? Especially if you're doing exercises that use that full range of motion. Um, yeah, you, you may not have to stretch much at all uh, just to maintain the flexibility, all right? Uh, and then the one thing I wanna say is, you are doing multiple times per day, the one time not to do it is immediately before explosive performance, okay? And even that refers to like excessive stretching or like really thorough stretching, okay? Um, and what, what happens with really thorough stretching is it can deaden your reflexes. So then if you go, you know, say you stretch your quads like 20 minutes each and then you go try to jump, you're probably not gonna jump very well because your reflexes in your quads are gonna be kind of shut down for a moment, okay? Uh, one time I spent, a long time on each hamstring and I went to the track and tried to run and I could not run to save my life. It was really bad. Okay, but those are like extreme cases. So don't, 
don't totally stretch a muscle for half an hour before you're trying to do something athletic. Okay, that's the, the one um, restriction on stretching a lot. All right. But a bit of stretching can help before before perfecting it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, like if you're in your warm up and you're doing, I mean, okay. Yeah, I'm doing a little stretching. This is not going to hurt me. No, it's more that really excessive thorough stretching. Okay. Um, and also, if you have again, if you're at a level where you think you're good on, on flexibility, uh, if you have some other mobility routine, I'm not opposed to that. There's nothing wrong with using other other forms for mobility. Um, but I will say, if you need to make change in a muscle. Uh, I think stretching is the best way to do that. Stretching and then strength training with that range of motion. Um, I don't think you can, you know, if you like, if I'm trying to touch my toes and I'm like here, right? I don't think I'm gonna foam roll my way all the way down to my, my toes. Okay, I'm not gonna get that dramatic change from like, the, you know, just mobility drills. Okay, in, in that situation, I need to stretch. I need to hip hinge over and over and over to get my hamstrings more flexible. Okay, so then moving on to our sample program, we're adding stretching. Daily stretching, okay, simple enough to understand. Again, maybe not a requirement for everybody, but if you need to change one of your muscles, stretch regularly, stretch often. Okay, any questions? All good? Okay. Uh, moving on to strength training, all right, this is gonna be a lot of stuff. All right, what do we get from strength training? Structural and neurological strength. We've talked about that already. Hope, hope you guys understood that. Um, strength training is going to be something where we're, again, we're using a load that's more challenging to move. All right, so we're going to get a greater stimulus, uh, greater strength stimulus um, from some of these more challenging exercises compared to jumping and sprinting. Okay, so it's going to take us to a higher level of adaptation. Um, again, jumping, sprinting, athletic things do give us some level of strength, but we can get a higher level by using strength-focused training. All right, and then again, it's going to contribute to that muscle length that I've been talking about, adding more links to the chain. Okay, strength training is big for that. All right, so we got to talk about structural strength. We're going to be looking at uh, some exercises and trying to uh, basically evaluate like what is the structural and the neurological stimulus we're getting from these exercises. Okay, so let's think about structural strength. Things that we want are things that are going to affect the structural stimulus. Uh, one is just the resistance, okay? So uh, resistance though does not just mean heavier weight, okay? Uh, it's actually gonna refer to the resistance torque at a joint. So I thought that I was gonna have a board to draw on. I didn't, so instead I came up with this super great diagram right before we started. Uh, so it looks like this. Uh, so the top, it's a stick, a stick figure of a squat, right? Okay? Obviously. So, <laughs> is that the right hands at the top, right? Yeah, so guys, yeah. Okay, so, so question about if, we, <laughs> if we look at the horizontal distance from the knee to the red line, okay? The red line is basically like about where your center of mass is, okay? And so it's, it's how much mass you have times that horizontal distance is gonna tell us what the resistance torque at the knee is. Okay, so it's both factors are in there. It's both the, it's the, uh, the force and the lever arm. Okay, um, the bottom is the, the, the knees over toes squat that Ben was doing, right? Uh, so at, at the bottom, uh, we don't have any additional load, we just have body weight. But that horizontal distance to the knee from the center of mass is much longer. So we can have a very similar uh, resistance torque at the knee joint with a body weight exercise or with a heavy back squat, okay? One is using heavier weight to accomplish that, that uh, resistance torque, the other one is using a really long moment arm and lighter weight, okay? But we have a high load on the quadriceps in both cases, all right? So again, the, the, the resistance doesn't just mean heavier weight, okay? All right, uh, effort level, right? If we have an exercise that is forcing us to try really hard, that's gonna be a stronger structural stimulus. Uh, momentum. This is a big one, okay? So anytime that we are stopping momentum, whether it be horizontal, vertical, uh, that's gonna increase the amount of force that your muscles produce, okay? And that's just a, like a property of physics, right? Like if, uh, if I dropped a ball on the ground from three feet, okay? And then I dropped the ball on the ground from six feet, it's gonna have more momentum when it hits the ground, so the ground is gonna apply more force to it when it hits the ground. Does that make sense? So the ground didn't change. There's nothing different about the ground, but it's gonna apply more force 
when the other object has more momentum. Okay, so same thing with exercises. Uh, when we are stopping momentum, and the more momentum we're stopping, we're gonna get a stronger muscle tension, tendon tension. Okay, it's gonna be a stronger uh, structural stimulus. All right, uh, muscle length, it's another big one. Okay, so if we train with full range of motion, we have the muscles stretched out. When muscles are stretched out, they produce more tension. We're gonna get a stronger structural stimulus from that. And then also volume versus intensity. So when we're trying for structure, we're gonna use more volume, okay? Uh, meaning like more repetitions, okay? Uh, so if I'm doing a, let's say we're talking about uh, a squat, and I do five sets of two, and I work up to a heavy weight, uh, it's only 10 total reps. The structural stimulus on the target muscles, which would be like glute squats, uh, is not gonna be as great as if I did um, three sets of 10 at 60%. Okay, 60% of my max is not gonna be that difficult. Three sets of 10, not gonna be that difficult. But with all the reps, the 30 reps, I'm gonna get more of a structural stimulus from that. Okay, so the, the volume is gonna give us more structure than the intensity. Okay? So we go past that awesome diagram again. All right, so high stress example, an exercise that has high structural stress would be your hip hinges. All right, so we're gonna go to the next So we have, we have uh, a decent amount of resistance on the bar, okay? We have, is that a loop? Dang it, go back. De decent amount of resistance on the bar. The weight has downward momentum, okay? So when we stop it, that's gonna give a lot of tension in the hamstring muscles. Uh, we also have the hamstring muscles lengthened at the bottom. Okay, so we're basically putting together all the factors for a really strong structural stimulus. Okay, so uh, that is why, yeah, I don't like that. Anyway, sorry. Um, that is why hip hinges will make your hamstrings so sore. If you're not used to them and you do it for the first time, it's a really strong stimulus on, uh, on that muscle. Okay, all right, so we go back. Okay, uh, low, stre low stress example. The reverse sled drags that Ben was talking about, right? Uh, we have small range of motion, right? We're not lengthening our quads very much. We're not stopping any momentum. It's all, uh, we're going with the momentum of the sled, right? Um, the effort could be high or it could be sort of more medium. Um, and then, yeah, the load could be high, could be medium. But yeah, anytime we're working with a shorter range of motion and it's not stopping any momentum, it's not gonna actually be that stressful. So that's gonna be more of a therapeutic stimulus on the quadriceps muscle and the, uh, the quadriceps tendon, okay? So it's not nearly as stressful as uh, on the quads as say like the, the deep split squat or like a, a heavy uh, back squat, okay? Does that make sense? So we got the higher intensity and then we got the lower, the, the, yeah, the higher stress example and the lower stress example. All right, what's another example of a high structural stress in an exercise? Anybody? Box jumps? Box jumps. Okay, uh, at what point in the box jump? So when we drop down and we're stopping that momentum, then yes, we could have a pretty decent st uh, structural stress there um, on yeah, the quad tendon and the quad muscles. Things that would make it more stressful would be uh, adding weight, dropping down fast, dropping down farther, right? Because if I drop down farther, I'm lengthening my quads more, so I'm reaching that muscle length. Uh, so yeah, I would say box jumps would be maybe more of a medium uh, one, unless we add some of those other factors that you could turn it into a high stress one. Yeah, any other examples? Nordics. Nordics. Nordics, yes, okay, so Nordics, which, I don't have a video, I hope you guys know what it is. Uh, we don't have a lot of momentum, but we do have some and we're trying to stop it and failing on the way down. Okay, so we get a lot of tension from that. Um, we don't quite have the hamstring muscle length, but still we have like a long period of time where we're fighting this decline. Um, so yes, we do have a high structural stress on the hamstring muscles from that exercise. Okay? Uh, all right, so then I wanna give another example myself. It would be lunge jumps, which, okay, I gotta go down two now. Old school jump science from YouTube. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. All right, so lung jumps. Again, we have body weight here. Um, Just body weight, so it's not a super heavy load, uh, but we're in a, a relatively weak position in a lunge. Uh, and then we have the glutes lengthened at the bottom, right? Or down in a lunge, our glutes are stretched out. And then the key is we have the downward momentum from that jump, okay? So when we're stopping that momentum, we're actually gonna get a lot of tension in the glutes. So again, if you are you know, relatively new to strength training, lunge, uh, lunge jumps will tear your glutes up, they'll make you sore for days. Okay, and you wouldn't maybe think that because they don't feel like super heavy or hard, but you do like three sets of 12 of those, you, yeah, you could be sore for four or five days after that if you're, uh, you know, if you're pretty vulnerable to structural stress at that time. Okay, so yeah, that downward momentum plays a big role, okay? Um, so if we go back here, last point is explosive exercise can provide a high structural stress, okay, such as the lunge jump such as this is why jumping provides a high stress on your knees, is because of the momentum that we have. Okay, so when we step into an approach jump and we stop that momentum right here, that's why we get high knee stress, okay? If we did a, a, a jump from this position statically and just jumped like that, that would not be high structural stress. It's the stopping of the momentum is what makes jumping hard on your patellar tendons, okay? So yeah, that momentum plays a big role. Okay, next. Okay, so structural strength. We want to get accustomed to the high stress, all right? It sounds kind of scary when you talk about it, like, ooh, it's high stress, right? Um, people say things like, oh, that puts a lot of stress on your back or stress on your knees or whatever. We want to get to a point where we're accustomed to that because um, that's gonna protect us, right? If you can endure high stress in your training, uh, you're gonna be resistant to the stress of your sport or to jumping, okay? Uh, so a, health, a healthy athlete may be able to jump right into that high stress, okay? Um, yeah, so you take a relatively untrained person, you have them do hip hinges, you have them do uh, lunges, um, calf raises with a stretch in the, in the gastroc muscle. It's gonna make them very sore, um, and it might take a while for them to recover, but they should be able to safely go into those exercises, okay? Uh, but if you have something that's unhealthy, such as that good old jumper's knee, then you have to progress towards that high structural stress, okay? So that's like what Ben was talking about, start with a sled, start low stress, Start with minimal range of motion, okay? And then you work towards it, okay? Um, but yeah, we do wanna get to a point where you can handle high structural stress and do it pretty much all over your body so you can protect as much as possible, okay? Uh, structural strength, so then just one more last time with the long muscles. The same exercises that provide the high structural stress are gonna give us the, the ones, those are the ones that are gonna give, give us the long muscles, okay? Build those links in the chain that make us more powerful and more protective. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's the high structural stress exercises that are gonna do that for us. All right? How often? How often do we do the high stru uh, structural stress? The high stress, one to two days per week on the same muscle, right? So I could do hip hinges uh, one or two days per week, that'd be a good amount. Now I could do it more. Uh, once I get accustomed to it, I could hip hinge five days a week if I wanted to. It would be a lot, and it would probably you know, fatigue me a little bit over time. But I could do that once I get used to it. Um, but yeah, we definitely want to be able to do it a couple times a week. Uh, and if we're talking about a therapeutic stimulus, we could do that more often, right? So look like this, this sled drags, the light stretch, the sled drags, you could do those almost every day. And that would not be problematic. Um, ankle exercises, right? You, you've got an ankle sprain and you're doing some therapy for it, do it every day, that's cool, okay? Uh, yeah, so the, the lighter structural stress you can do more often, um, the, the higher stress we're looking at more one or two, two uh, per, so, okay, we're plugging some exercises into our program. Hinges and lunges, those are structural exercises. Lateral lunge and calf raises, uh, more structure. Single leg hinge and split squat on the last, or on that uh, fifth day. Uh, so we're adding those structural exercises. This is an, an example of how you could organize that. It doesn't have to be that way, just an example, okay? Questions? That was a lot. Yes? So we say you do an exercise like five days a week. So what I mean is like once you get accustomed to the stress, you may not ever get sore anymore, and you could 
do that and, and bounce back from it very quickly, um, and then you can do it more frequently. Frequently, but I, I wouldn't say that's necessarily like a goal that you need to have. Okay. Um, I'd be more interested. So let's say we're talking about the hamstrings. Uh, I'd be more interested. Yeah, I have a hinge. I have a single leg hinge, so I'm hitting it twice per week. And then I'm more interested in being able to like run and jump every day, or maybe five days a week, than uh, than like just hinge more and more. Okay. Any others? This is where we got to talk about training transfer. All right, so with structural, uh, we build up the quadriceps muscle um, to, to some degree, regardless of how we do it, even if it's not with an exercise that's anything like our sport or like jumping, um, it's still going to be good because you use the quadriceps muscle when you jump, right? Uh, with neurological strength, we want to have more of a similarity in the movement pattern that we're training, okay? So when we jump, sprint, do athletic things, uh, typically we are either pushing off the ground with ankle, knee, hip, spine, pushing, extending all together, or flexing all together, right? I flex hip, knee, ankle together when I run, or when I'm going into a jump, right? I'm like right here, they're all flexed together, I hit the ground, it's all extending together. Okay, so what we want is, in our strength training, we wanna train large scale extension patterns, large scale flexion patterns, to get that neurological transfer to our sports, okay? So that's your, your big functional movements, like squat and deadlift, for example. Um, if we compare squat and deadlift, so yeah, we have the knee and the hip extension, right, along with the spinal extension happening in those, in those big exercises. Compare that to just a knee extension in a machine. Neurologically, I'm doing this. All I'm doing is sending a whole bunch of signals to my quadriceps. I'm not really training that large scale pattern, okay? So the knee extension machine, nothing wrong with it. I'm still getting a stimulus on my quadriceps, right, and on my quadriceps tendon, but neurologically, I'm not really training that movement pattern to strengthen that large scale pattern, okay? So we understand the difference between those? Yes, good. All right. Uh, other examples, I put in jumps and throws. So these are, when we jump, so we're talking about like loaded jumps, or like loaded throws, like a clean or a snatch, I would consider a loaded throw, medicine ball throws, uh, jumps with a weight vest, jumps with weights. Um, these are obviously, large scale patterns, they're obviously functional. The question is, is it enough load to really make us stronger? Okay, to actually uh, get our nervous system to adapt to anything. Um, and that would be, sometimes yes, sometimes no. If we have a totally untrained person and they start doing jump squats, yeah, they're probably gonna get stronger from that. Okay, if we have someone who's been doing heavy back squats for five years and they do jump squats, are they gonna get stronger? Probably not. Okay, so everything's relative, all right? And it's a lot of contextual uh, there, but yeah, jumps and throws certainly are functional large-scale extension patterns. The question is, are they heavy enough to really change us? All right, and then obviously the last factor is load. Heavier is a stronger stimulus, right? If I put more weight on the bar on a squat or a deadlift, it's going to give me a stronger neurological strength stimulus. Okay, how often? So if we're talking moderate or heavy loads, one to three days per week would be sort of a typical recommendation, right? So you could have a um, like a one heavy squat and deadlift day and then the rest of your uh, week could be like just structural exercises and it would be easier, not as fatiguing. Um, or you could add some more and it's just a matter of do you, do you balance it out at some point with more rest? Also, what are you accustomed to, right? If we have a new lifter, one good squat day per week might be plenty for a neurological strength. If uh, you're like me, you've been lifting for like 18 years, then you know I need a little more stimulus than one squat day per week. So. Uh, one to three days, just a rough recommendation. You also have examples of people who do heavy squatting seven days a week, right? Um, it, it can work in certain situations. There's not a lot of hard, fast rules here, but uh, just general recommendation, one to three days. Um, neurological stress is not isolated to a body part, okay? So I do uh, some squats, I blast my quads and my glutes pretty good, um, but I don't just have neurological stress on my quads and my glutes. I have the neurological stress on my whole nervous system. Okay, so if I do a hard, heavy squat day, my bench is probably gonna suck the next day. Okay, it's universal. Uh, I'm probably not going to snatch or jump very well the next day. It's universal stress, okay? So that's a, that's a, a big thing to understand. Yeah, that fatigue is, is large scale and it's gonna affect you across the board. Um, whereas in structural strength, uh, yeah, you know, I have hamstring soreness that's not gonna necessarily influence my quads or muscles. 
but the nervous system is more universal. All right? Uh, so we're plugging in some neurological strength for the program. We got box squats and dips. Oh, yeah, upper body pushing and pulling is our neurological strength. Okay? So dips is an example. Um, day three, we got deep squats and pull ups. And day five, we got the deadlift in there. Okay? So those are plugging in some uh, neurological strength exercises. And probably if we were doing that setup, we wouldn't do box squat, deep squat, and deadlift all heavy in there. We'd probably do one of those more of like a medium day. Okay? Um, again, depending on who you are, how much lifting experience you have, and things like that. All right, so again, if this is an example of a setup. It's not like a, you know, the setup or something. Okay? Strength training, any questions? Yes? So for somebody like you said, I'm not familiar with strength training, but I haven't been strength training for a while. Would you recommend jumping with weights, or would you say that's only for beginners? So there's, so I would say, if you're starting out strength training again, like say you've taken a break from it, you could return by jumping with weights, or, or yeah, like throws, like cleans, things like that. Um, and you might be able to get stronger because you haven't done it for a little bit. But if you've like been squatting for a couple months already, you're probably not gonna get any stronger from a lesser strength stimulus. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, it's kind of contextual. Like what is my body currently a, 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 um, accustomed to? And then also say you wanna take a break from heavy lifting. I'm gonna take a break from like deadlift and squat. Um, doing some jump squats, doing some cleans might help you maintain your strength without the same high stress level as the heavier stuff. So th there are contexts where it could make sense for you to use it even as an experienced lifter. Um, but yeah, if you're already like squatting and you're used to that, like doing jump squats is probably not gonna change you at all. Okay? Yeah. Did you do the same thing? That's what you're saying about jump Yes, uh, yeah, put them some, somewhat in the same category, where it's, uh, it's strength training, but it's explosive, so it's not as heavy as like a deadlift or a squat, so it doesn't have the same uh, level of fatigue that's associated with it, it's not as uh, strong a stimulus, yeah. And so also, yeah, it's less fatiguing, it's also less likely to stimulate change, right? Yeah, like a deadlift is gonna make me stronger than a clean is, okay? So, uh, power Sure, yes, except, so yeah, like, yeah, the first row, his explosive training is like clean and snatch. Yeah, Although a lot, of, a lot of Olympic lifters do use jumps uh, as a way of training like a higher level of explosiveness, like a faster, uh, a faster method than just the clean and the snatch, yeah. Yep. Okay. How long have I been talking? 43 minutes. 42? 43 minutes. For the second group. You have till three. Three? Okay. Alright. I feel like it's two more time. But anyway. <laughs> Alright, moving on. Sprinting and plyos. Okay, what do we get from sprinting and plyo? We get explosiveness, we get elasticity, we get strength. Now that's the same stuff we get from jumping, minus technique. Alright? So the question is, uh, if we get the same stuff as jumping, why would we even bother with sprinting and plyos? There is an answer. Okay. Why bother? few reasons. One, we can train explosiveness with less knee stress, okay? So if I do sprinting, I can train explosiveness, I can train elasticity like that uh, without this nearly the knee stress of jumping, okay? So I could, yeah, let's say I, uh, let's say I have a little knee pain or something, I can still train explosively with other, other means. Or even if I don't have knee pain, it's a way to be yeah, more safe with it, right? Um, another example, we can get uh, very targeted, higher intensity. Okay, so the example here would be your shock method. So these are uh, Russian, Russian, uh, it's a Russian training method. It's like the original plyometrics um, where he, uh, a guy named Bergashansky had athletes dropping from high heights at the ground and then either sticking the landing or bouncing right up. When we do things like that, we get very high ground reaction forces, uh, potentially higher than when we do approach jumps. Um, but we also are very specifically targeting the stretch reflex. Because when you drop from a high height, 
uh, you hit the ground, again, your quads, your glutes, your soleus muscle, lengthening very fast. So we're gonna stimul stimulate the stretch reflex in those muscles, okay? So we can specifically target something like that with certain plyos, okay? Um, and also, elasticity is going to be trained best by minimal knee bend, exercises with minimal knee bend, short contact time, so we're off the ground fast, um, and then high volume, okay? So jumping trains elasticity to some degree, okay? But we tend to use a little bit longer contact times, um, we bend the knees more, and we don't necessarily jump with super high volume, right? Like again, maybe you jump, if it's a longer day, you might do that 30, 40 jumps in a session, like approach jumps, right? Um, that's a relatively low number of foot contacts. Okay, if we compare that to a track practice where an athlete's running a thousand meters, they're getting 500 elastic foot contacts. Okay, um, so yeah, we need that volume to really develop elasticity, unless you have it uh, just have it naturally. So track athletes are the ones that we look to for that. Um, and I don't know how many guys are track athletes and been around track athletes, but they have elasticity after years of running track. Okay, and it's because of the volume of elastic foot contacts that they get. Now they may not be super jumpers if they're not, they don't have a jumping background, but they do have elasticity, okay? Even like cross country runners, right? Like I started training a cross country runner recently. He's not like muscularly powerful or explosive, but dude is elastic. He can bounce off the ground pretty well, even though he's not like a highly coordinated or powerful athlete, okay? So it's the, the volume of elastic contacts that we can get from uh, running, sprinting, or even just like, like what I put in here. Uh, oh, it's not gonna be good. Um, hopping, skipping, things like that. Uh, we can get a lot of foot contacts and develop elasticity that way. So those are reasons why we would still use uh, sprinting or plyometrics um, and not just jump all the time, okay? So yeah, we've got the categories. Your high intensity is gonna have maximum effort. It's gonna have high force in the ground and it'd be a lower volume. Okay, so all out sprinting would be an example. Uh, if you're sprinting fast, if you're not a track athlete, you'd probably limit it to like 60 meters, maybe even shorter, right? Um, and then you might do like four or five reps in a workout, maybe even like two or three, honestly. So it's not gonna be a high volume if you're doing all out sprinting. Um, drop jumps, that's one of the shock method where we're dropping off something and bouncing up. Um, again, very intense, you might do like three sets of five of that, right? So that's like 15 reps total. Not high volume, but it's high intensity. Uh, speed bounding would be another example. That's bounding for distance. Again, you might do a set of like six and do like three sets. That's 18 contacts at a low volume, high intensity. Uh, then we have the low intensity category. So it's lower force, not necessarily lower effort, but it could be some maximal effort. Um, then we're getting higher volume. So again, running, hopping, skipping. Yeah, you might run 1,000 meters at 75%. You get 500 elastic contacts. You might hop it back and forth across a line and get a couple hundred contacts from that. Uh, you could do a, you know, you could do a hundred skips in a day, uh, get a couple hundred contacts from that. It's lower intensity, but it's higher volume. But those those exercises do have some value. All right. So how often should we do these things? Higher intensity be a one to two day kind of thing. Okay. Especially if you're already jumping. Right. So when we get to our example, we already have two jump days. I'm not going to put in like two or three uh, separate high intensity plyo days. Okay. We're actually, I think put in just one of uh, sprinting and bounding. Uh, the lower intensity could be uh, more often if you want it to be. If you're trying to work on some elastic volume, uh, that will be an option you could do uh, you know, several days. Again, sub-maximal running, you know, 70% is not gonna be really stressful on your body. It's not gonna fatigue you a ton, so you could uh, do that relatively often. The same thing with like the hopping, the skipping, okay? Those are things you could do pretty often if you wanted to. All right, so we're plugging some of those things into our program. We got running, so we got low intensity, some volume on day one. Uh, day three, we got some sprinting and bounding, those are high intensity, lower volume. Uh, and then we also have some line hops, which is just back and forth across the line like this. Okay, that's some lower intensity, higher volume. And then uh, day five, did not have any in that day. So yeah, we got some lower intensity and some higher intensity plugged into the program now. Okay, so uh, we have plugged in all our training methods now. We have jumping, stretching, strength training, and sprinting plyos. This is not necessarily like a really thorough program, okay? So put a, a few more things in there, like uh, some dorsiflexion, some hip flexion, some spinal flexion, 
Uh, put those in on day two and four, and then I put on day six, got a little basketball in there, right? Some of you guys play a sport, right? So sometimes you got to play your sport. Um, so if we're looking at this as a whole, this is starting to get to be uh, like a pretty, a fairly complete week of training, okay? Um, if you start adding more to that, then you've got to start thinking about subtracting, okay? So I could probably get another day of hoops in there, and it'd be fine. Okay, but if I start playing basketball every day, now I'm getting a lot of stimulus from basketball. If I do that, now maybe I'm taking out that running on day one. Maybe I'm thinking about taking out some, or maybe I'm reducing the sprinting and the bounding a little bit. Maybe I'm reducing the jumping. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I don't even bother with the line hops, right? Because line hops aren't that different from what you're gonna get from basketball, the stimulus, right? Um, so yeah, there's, there's a certain point where it's like you gotta look at the totality of what you're doing. This is where we get to that big picture concept and say how much is a, a reasonable amount that I can adapt to and then how much is like just gonna, just gonna uh, tear my body down and not really let me adapt, okay? So one of the biggest problems that I see in training is that people love to add too much, okay? So common, and I think Basketball players, volleyball players, I, I deal with this a lot. Daily sport player practice, right? Uh, they add additional skill sessions on top of that. You know, we're getting our 500 shots a day. Uh, maybe we do jump training on top of that, which is a whole training program in itself. Lower body strength training plus jumping exercises. Then they add on bodybuilding to that because we got to bulk up a little bit for basketball, okay? Um, and bodybuilding is a high stress on your body. Then exhaustive core workouts. Okay, just keep adding, and then conditioning on top of that. So they just, people love to add way too much, and when you do that, you give your body no chance to adapt, all right? Um, it's much better to train relatively easy, train a lower volume, and actually adapt to what you do, than to just pile on all these things, and then you just get nowhere in any of it, okay? So this is where I'm getting to that big picture now, okay? So we, we put together, you know, a reasonable week of training. You can't just keep adding on and adding on and adding. Okay, it's a key, a key thing to understand. Now, talking about giving your body a chance to adapt, a big thing for that is nutrition, okay? So I'm just doing one slide on this, it's gonna be quick. Uh, athletes gotta eat, that's been a slogan of mine for several years, okay? You uh, have a high activity level, you put a lot of stress on your body, you need a lot of calories in order to fuel your body, and also to get a training response, right? This is the tough thing, guys, is it's, it's very easy to do a ton of work and not get any better at anything, okay? That's actually a common thing, because um, you do too much work and you don't eat enough to deal with all that work. So this can easily make or break your training, okay? Nutrition could easily be the difference between getting better or not getting better, all right? So athletes gotta eat, you cannot be skimpy uh, with your calories uh, or with, yeah, or well, your macronutrients. Okay, I can go to the second slide, I forgot about that. So daily recommendations. A lean athlete with a normal activity level, I'll say, for an athlete, uh, so pretty regular exercise. Calories per day, body weight in pounds times 20. Okay, so I'm 220, I could probably be a little leaner. So let's say if I was lean, I'm 210, uh, that's 4,200 calories a day. Okay, for me with a, you know, maybe working out like four or five days a week. Okay, and that, would, that seems about reasonable for me uh, right now. When I was playing high school basketball, I had a higher activity level, long practices. I was eating about 6,000 calories a day. Uh, and I weighed only about 200 pounds. I was super lean. I wasn't gaining weight from that. I actually needed all those calories. Okay, 6,000 is more than most people eat. Um, okay, so grams of carbs. Again, we're going back to that times 20 for the calories. Grams of carbs, body weight times three. So for me, 210 pounds, that's 630 grams of carbs per day. That's a lot of carbs, okay? But if I'm active, I need that. All right, I need those carbs. Carbs are your best fuel source. Grams of protein, body weight, pounds, 210 grams of protein a day. Um, I think you'll find, in order to get to that type of number, I mean, for me, 210, for you, whatever your weight is, you gotta be pretty intentional about protein. You gotta try to put protein in every meal, and you gotta not skip meals, okay? Um, and supplementation can help you with that, too. But again, if you take a protein shake, it's probably like 30 grams, you know? That's like, if you're 150 pounds, that's a fifth of your daily need. Okay, so one protein shake not cut it. All right, we gotta be protein throughout the day, all the meals. Uh, grams of fat, body weight pounds divided by two. Uh, yeah, don't totally cut fat out, but honestly, 
most people need to worry about that. Most people are probably going to have the fat be a little bit too high. The protein's probably going to be a little too low. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to encourage you to like try to get more fat necessarily. Uh, and then try to get them from the healthiest sources possible. That's uh, kind of common sense. I'm not going to get a whole lot into that, but eating healthier is better for you than not. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Questions. Yes. Hey. popular for weight loss, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it for an active person, for an active athlete. Um, or an active athlete who's trying to get better at performance. I mean, you can survive and be fine, <laughs> but are you going to adapt your training? Are you going to respond well to your training? Are you going to have good endurance through your uh, workouts and practices and games? Probably not. Um, the, the research on ketogenic diet is intriguing, but I definitely don't think we're at a point of like recommending it to somebody with a high activity level yet. Yeah. Um, okay. Don't like it at all for athletes. Sorry, <coughs> I know Selby does it. Where's he at? I do it too every day, man. Bummer, dude. Yeah. That's, that's why I asked because I do it. Yeah, don't recommend it at all. Sorry, guys. Well, I, 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 I believe I believe it can be done right, but I just think it's very difficult. Well, I, I think I can back up both of you guys because the average college athlete these days is up at 6 a.m. workouts, then practice at 7 a.m. Right. Then after you got individual work, and then maybe all your team training sucks. Yeah. There's a difference between eating to improve your body. Like I also will do things calorie wise that are less just to be lean. Yeah. Because I'm not being paid to go all day long. You know what I mean? Like yes. so I'll even I'll even know that I'm not getting like a ton of nutrition. Sure. And even suffer on the court and just kind of enjoy the process of stripping off body fat, which is different. Right. So I actually agree with both sides. Yeah. 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 Again, context, right? Like if you're again if you're training on your own and you can control your own workouts. Um, and you can you have the schedule in place where you can implement intermittent fasting and actually get the needs uh, meet meet the needs that you have. Um, okay, do it. But I'm just very hesitant to like recommend it to the population. Um, if you don't have control over your workouts, you're at school all day or you're at, like long practices. Um, very difficult, I think, to really meet your needs with that like an eight hour feeding window. Okay. Um, all right. So. Again, we're trying to get big picture. So we talked about like a week, a uh, week of training. Um, we got to talk about, what about like a month though, or six months, right? So long-term goals, approach for, we want to get to your height times 0.6, that's when we're getting into like elite jumping, okay? Um, some of you, I mean, if you get that high, obviously keep trying to go higher, but that's, you know, that's a, a good long-term goal for most people. Um, ways to get there. Increase RSI over time. I think you guys mentioned, or you guys tested RSI yesterday, right? That's the uh, this. But yeah, the drop jump, right? Yeah. So I didn't put up a specific number because I don't know exactly how they were calculating. Different people have different ways, but um, if you can keep that increasing over time, that's gonna be a good indication you're increasing uh, the center rate of force development and elasticity, okay? Um, strength goal, keep back squat. Get the body weight times two. Um, that may be a like impossible goal for some taller athletes, some less gifted strength athletes, um, some shorter ones who are pretty strong naturally. They find that to be easy. In which case, like you know, you can keep going, right? Um, but yeah, that's you know, increasing your deep back squat strength is a good way to uh, continue to build your athleticism over time. Uh, your deadlift should be stronger than your squat. Now, I didn't have a specific max number there because I don't necessarily encourage tons of max deadlifting. For athletes, um, uh, but you should be able to tell, like if you put your max squat on the bar on the ground, you should be able to pick it up a lot easier than you could squat it. Okay, and that's we we say that because we want to have high hip extension strength relative to uh, the squat, which is typically going to be limited by knee extension strength. Okay, so yeah, if we're if we got a higher squat than deadlift, we probably need to work on hip extension strength. Um, and then addressing structure throughout the body. So we have like the squat and the deadlift are you know, kind of good uh, measures of strength, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing you should do. Okay, we still want to use those structural exercises throughout your body to uh, protect yourself. Okay? Um, yes. So long-term goals, trying to accomplish those things. So yeah, we're getting into the long-term programming then. So again, yeah, we have a good week. We gotta get to what's a, what's a good month, what's a good six months, what's a good year. 
um, things we're gonna have to do, manage fatigue, right? So even with that week that we put up, which is like, you know, decent, reasonable amount of training, over time, there's gonna be some accumulation of fatigue there, okay? So then we would have to use things um, like easy, easy weeks of training or uh, easy months of training even, okay? Uh, we'll also have to manage strength versus explosiveness and elasticity, okay? This is getting into tricky stuff where strength training is very different than jumping and sprinting, all right? And there's some adaptations there that are conflicting to some degree. So sometimes over time, uh, strength training can interfere with some of those other qualities. And we may have to manage that correctly in order to maximize those more athletic qualities, okay? Um, so yeah, we wanna look at how does your strength compare to athleticism? Okay, so as your strength goes up, are you getting more athletic? Um, if not, that's where you look at how do we manage that, that, um, that kind of battle between those different qualities, okay? So yeah, if I'm at a one and a half body weight squat and I'm jumping 36 inches, and I get up to 1.7 on my squat, and I'm still jumping 36 inches, well I gotta do something there, right? Maybe I'm fatigued and I just need to rest to get the jump up, or maybe I need to do something different with regards to um, explosiveness and elasticity, okay? Um, so that's a kind of a broad look at that, um, and this is where we really gotta get into, into a, like a case-by-case -case basis, all right? So it's, it's kind of solving the puzzle of each person. So I'm just gonna look at a few uh, example scenarios here. So athlete has a, a good jumping background, so they know how to jump. Um, their explosiveness and their elasticity are already good, whether from genetics or whether from their background of athleticism, uh, they're already pretty good. Um, what they do is they get stronger over time and their burden increases over time, okay? It's a very simple process. Uh, this is kind of the scenario we want, right? It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, just keep getting stronger, keep jumping higher. It's all easy. In that case though, that still doesn't mean that you just repeat the same training week for three years, right? You're still gonna have to manage some fatigue in there. So then that's where you use some easy weeks and easy months. Okay, so uh, let's say you do four weeks in a row of that, that uh, program that we were looking at earlier. Um, probably gonna be a little fatigued there, so we're gonna use an easy week. It might look like, look like this. Sprint, low volume, box squat, low volume, do some dips. Another day, jump, same leg, hinge, pull ups. Okay, so we're not completely abandoning our hamstring structure that week. Um, but it's a pretty darn easy week, right? If you come off of that, you're definitely gonna be feeling better than if you're working out like four or five days. And, and also, we would do like, you know, lighter weights, lower volume on this, on this lifting compared to a harder week. Okay, so that's what uh, an easy week might look like. Now, if you need, let's say you do, you do that training program we were looking at before, the complete week. And you do that for uh, a month, you take a week off, you do an, uh, something similar for another month, you take a week off, do something similar for another month, you do say that for four months. Now maybe we actually need like an easy <coughs> month. We need a longer term easy period to manage some of that fatigue. Maybe, again, we don't know until you get there and find out, but you might need an easier month. So an easier month might look something like this. It's not quite as uh, low in volume as that easy week, um, but we have, Again, we took out some of the, the running, we took out some of the harder lifting, right? Like box squat is the only uh, big neurological lift up there now, okay? Um, yeah, so a little bit less like plyometric volume, but we're still jumping twice a week, doing a little bit of sprinting and bounding, we got one basketball day in there, and we have not abandoned the structural stuff, okay? So again, when we get into this period where we're trying to maximize the elasticity and explosiveness, um, you don't want to forget about structure, right? If you spend you know, six months building up your quad strength and you're uh, protecting your quad tendon and you just completely abandon it for a month, uh, you know, you're opening the door for problems to come back. So we don't want to just completely abandon structure. But again, we're doing things that are easy, right? A single leg hinge is not gonna fatigue you um, like, a, like a heavy deadlift would, okay? Um, yeah, I mean, dorsiflexion, calves, these are like smaller detailed exercises where we're, we're addressing structure, but it's not gonna be fatiguing, okay? All right, so that was like the easier scenario, right? Where we just, gotta, we just gotta manage fatigue over time. Here's a difficult scenario. Now at Dunk Camp, I don't know how many people we would have like this, but this would be somebody who is um, maybe not as gifted explosively in, and, uh, and in terms of elasticity, and then they've been over strength trained. Okay, so I deal with this with my football guys that I train in Texas, right? They lift from like seventh grade to senior year, like pretty solid the whole time. And a lot of times the program is a little too strength heavy. 
So they end up in a place where they are, uh, they'll have a very strong uh, um, squat relative to body weight or clean relative to body weight or make, pick any measure. I mean, they can lunge a ton of weight, um, but they'll have average athleticism. Okay, and they might have like a, a 5.2 in the 40. Uh, and they might have a 26 inch approach jump, right? Things like that. Um, so in this situation, we need like a long term, large scale shift toward explosiveness and elasticity. Okay, we can't just keep pounding away at strength when they've over strength trained for years. Okay, so this is not, not a great situation to be in. This is one you make that long term shift and then it's, it's probably not gonna change really fast. Um, the only, if they were really fatigued and then you start resting, that could be some faster change. But um, yeah, you don't go from over lifting for years and then spend like a month not doing it and just totally transform. It's probably gonna be a long, process, long, gradual process of like getting faster and jumping a little bit higher at a time. Um, and again, we don't want to forget about structure. So we keep in some of those simple, easy structural exercises just to protect things like your Achilles tendon, things like your quadriceps tendon, okay? Um, so here's what that could look like. So we got jump, sprint, we got clean as a neurological strength stimulus. Why? Because it's easier than like a heavy squat or deadlift, but it might help us maintain some power. Uh, we still got you know, dorsiflexion, hip flexion, easy structural exercises. We got some more running in there. We're getting elastic volume. Okay, we got hoops in there. We got sprint, bound, drop, jump, and day three. So we got some high intensity plyos. Okay, we're doing a lot of things to try to get more explosive and more elastic. The lifting is all pretty easy. Oh yeah, I put a, I put a loaded jump in there too. So again, that's a neurological strength stimulus help us maintain something um, since we're not doing heavy lifting anymore. But a loaded jump is not gonna like keep us slow or fatigue us like, again, like a, a deep back squat work, okay? Are, we, are you guys tracking with me? Are we kind of, it's a different program and we have different situations, okay? We're solving that big picture, all right? Uh, next, in between scenario, okay? We've got a good jumping background, explosiveness and elasticity are good. We add strength, the vert goes up, but only for a short time. Maybe you get like a couple months where you get stronger, vert goes up, it's relatively simple. But then over time, uh, you keep getting stronger, you keep lifting, but your vert is stagnant or it goes down, okay? Um, this is where we need, again, we need a large scale shift to explosiveness and elasticity, but maybe it's gonna be more temporary. So maybe I um, haven't gotten more athletic for like a couple months, and then I'm gonna spend like a couple months doing this uh, shift towards explosiveness and elasticity, um, but it's, maybe it's not gonna have to be a couple of years as like the last scenario. Okay, um, which I think, yeah, so we're looking again at that same type of shift towards explosiveness and elasticity. By the way, this one is a lot of work, so this one would still have some like uh, accumulation of fatigue over a couple weeks, so you still need some easy weeks mixed in uh, with, with this one. Okay, so those are some scenarios to kind of like, kind of solve that big picture, all right, solve that puzzle. Um, so then what I want to do now, if we have time, is talk. Who wants? Is 2.5 the actual cutoff? It's 2.44. I think it's Connor. Is that cutoff? Um, yeah, it's 2.45. But... All right, one person talk to us. <laughs> Someone stand up and let's talk. Anybody? About your case study? Case yeah, like a, like a case study. Like uh, we'll talk about your vertical, your strength, things like that. Anybody? Who wants to come here? Anybody? Yeah, all right. What's your name? Elliot. Elliot, okay. Elliot, how tall are you? What's your best approach vertical? 26. 26 inches, all right. Uh, what type of athletic background do you have? Uh, college tennis. College tennis, okay, so not a ton of jumping background then? Well, I switched to beach volleyball. Switched okay, so jumping but on sand, which is soft surface, so less forceful, less elastic, okay, not quite the same stimulus. Um, and when did you switch, switch to beach volleyball, like after you were already an adult then? Yeah. Okay, so as a kid, not a lot of jumping background. Okay, so that's, a less than optimal scenario, I would say. I don't want to kill your, kill your vibe <laughs> right now, but it's best if we jump as a kid, okay? It's best if we become good jumpers as children. Um, okay, strength training background, what, what's there? Pretty intense. Pretty intense, okay. What type of, do you have any numbers, like relative to body weight? 495. Say that again? 495. 495, and what do you weigh, like 180 or something? Yeah, so that's a pretty good strength level. Um, so yeah, we would look at him and we would say his strength is probably is more developed than his vertical. Is 
that make sense? Because he's got, yeah, well, I mean, like over two and a half times body weight deadlift, probably a double body weight squat, right? Squat's pretty weak. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so we might have some knee extension to work on there. Um, but yeah, that, that big deadlift is a sign that strength is pretty well developed. So in his case, uh, yeah, I would say he needs, he needs jump practice, right? He needs to kind of make up for a little bit of like that, the, the childhood not developing that, that movement pattern. Um, should probably be doing a fair amount of elastic things. Um, maybe some that are easier on your knee. Do you have healthy knees or? Yeah. yeah, okay, so that's good. So you should be able to you know jump regularly and be safe. So that's a good sign. So yeah, I would say in this case, Pretty big uh, explosive and elastic focus, um, but still probably working on some knee strength. Um, so yeah, like quad exercises, like a lot of bends and knee over toe stuff would probably be good for you. Um, but yeah, definitely like staying relatively easier in the strength department. That's uh, to avoid like uh, the fatigue of it and avoid the slowing down effect that strength training can have. And then really, really going harder after explosiveness and elasticity. And that might be, again, that might be something that you spend a long time doing. Because, um, yeah, with a deadlift like that, I mean, I'd be hoping you could jump more like, uh, more like 36 inches, you know? So, so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of potential there for getting better from being more explosive and elastic versus just, like, getting stronger. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. His strength is higher than the, the vertical, so we got to bring up the, the explosive side of things. Yes? I was wondering if you can go back to the survival. Okay, the recommendations. 